Welcome guys to the Leathercraft Masterclass Q&A session. Uh, this session is a little bit different. I am, uh, let's just say, a little behind on my work. So I will be doing some stitching at the same time as doing the Q&A session at the same time as going live and recording this uh, for after the fact. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the stitching process as I'm going along. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we're going to go live and get straight into this with some uh, good questions. So I'm going to go live on Instagram. Don't forget to follow me on there, guys, if you want to see even more content. Uh, checking connection. You are now live. So we'll wait a couple seconds for people to come in on the live and then we'll get started on the questions. So grab yourself a cup of tea or a coffee if you have time. Sit back, relax. Maybe a glass of wine if you've had a long day. Coming into the weekend now. Welcome guys, welcome to today's Q&A session. Uh, I'm doing a Q&A session at the same time as stitching. I'm a little bit behind on work. Uh, it's already quarter past seven. I've still got so much to, do, to get done. Uh, so uh, I'll be doing a Q&A at the same time as stitching. Uh, difference between a round pricking iron and European. A round pricking iron. Uh, you mean like one of those, I think they call it a round dent. Uh, it's just, just a load of, uh, just makes a load of round holes is pretty much it. Like a round ore, which is what this is. Just goes through leather, makes a hole. Uh, doesn't give you the decorative stitch. Uh, I personally don't like it. I uh, don't own one. Some people like them. Uh, I've tried them. Uh, I find them, uh, especially through thick leather, very difficult to use. So not my cup of tea, I'm afraid. When do you use one over the other? Uh, well, I use one exclusively and never the other. So. <laughs> but I know what you mean. I think some people uh, like using it if you want a straighter, straighter looking stitch. Uh, just the round one will do. The hole punch on the other hand actually removes a small part of the leather uh, to make stitching with very thick thread uh, easier to do. Gives a much straighter stitch. Just depends on the aesthetic. I mean, you're removing leather, so you're automatically making it very slightly weaker. Whether that makes a difference depends on its intended use, really. But uh, yeah. That's the main gist of it. What's the best method for keeping dye from rubbing off? That's uh, actually one of my, uh, I'm gonna get started on the Q&A in a second. Uh, that's actually one of the questions. It may have been from you if it was, uh, if you sent that question in. <laughs> okay, so question number one, uh, this was sent through on Instagram stories. Uh, what's the best finish to use on veg tan leather? <laughs> Talk of the devil. Um, what's the best finish to use on veg tan leather after dyeing to prevent dye transfer? The best finish. Well, of the finishes that I've tried, uh, probably I would say Fibing's acrylic resiline. Uh, there is an upsize and some downsides to using acrylic resiline. The upsides are it's really good at preventing dye transfer. It also makes the surface of the leather very water resistant. It's one of the best for water resistance. The downsides is it can be a bit shiny. It does impart a bit of a sheen and, a, and that sheen can also feel a little bit synthetic. It doesn't feel like wax or anything like that. It feels a little bit plasticky. That's usually when you've put too much on or you've put more than one layer on, for example. So, I like to make sure that I get rid of all excess dye, if I've been hand dyeing, that is. Uh, I get rid of as much excess dye as possible, just using um, a wet rag. I mean, you can use a little bit of saddle soap as well. Uh, that sometimes helps. But uh, just a damp rag to go over the dye after it's dried. Uh, and, and rub off as much as you can, first of all. And then once that's complete, make sure it dries thoroughly again. And then you can try uh, diluted resiline. So like a 50-50 mix. 
and then you can apply that. But I would always try and test a piece first after, uh, after I mean, if you're gonna dye leather, you're probably gonna have a few scraps that you're trying and making sure that you've got the right color and applying the right amount to get the look that you want, first of all, or I hope you are. Um, so try on that little 50-50 and then see if you can rub it off on some shop towel or something like that if you're vigorous with it. How much rub off are you getting? If you get it a little bit damp, is it, does it still rub off? If so, you might need to go to a 75-20 mix, 75% acrylic resiline, 25% water. Um, unless you really like that shiny look that resiline imparts, but that's usually when it hasn't soaked in and uh, it's sitting on the surface. So that's just something to be aware of. Bag coat does work as well. It's you know, one of the things it's designed for. It's based on uh, shellac lacquer, which comes from secretions of the lac bug after it nibbles at the tree and secretes the resins that it gets from the tree. <laughs> Not many people know that, it's pretty gross. Uh, What's my thread thickness? Mm -hmm. 0 0.55. Uh, millimeters, obviously. Uh, just gonna scroll up, make sure I haven't... Oop, here we go. Uh, hi Phil, do you have any tricks up your sleeve for burnishing a right angle corner, for example, on a cutout ID window for a wallet interior. Um, well, yeah, you're gonna need something, uh, something with a right angle that can fit in there. So obviously a bone folder or a round slicker is not really gonna do, it's not gonna get in that 90 degree corner, okay? But something that's flat and has a 90 degree corner on it should do, okay? Uh, another option is instead of going along okay, along the piece of leather and up here into the corner, what you can do when you get into the corner is go back and forth and then change the angle from one side to the other. Can you see what I'm doing there? And on this one, doing the same thing back and forth, coming up, coming down, and then for the rest of it, you can then start going back and forth in, in the direction of the cut. Uh, so that's just one way of getting around it. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, there's another one here. When making a notebook, what do you recommend to do in the middle so the leather doesn't crease on the inside or the outside? Well, if it's creasing on the inside, generally, um, that might be a, what you call a finished back, where once the leather is split to its specific thickness in the tannery, they'll add a finish on the back that's uh, resin based so it looks very similar to the front and you can generally make items that don't require a lining okay so the back of it is is more visually appealing but sometimes um, depending on where on the hide especially if you go near the extremities of the hide near the flanks the belly section things like that where the fibers are quite loose the top layer of resin is quite rigid and it doesn't want to compress so instead of compressing into itself uh, it will just bend up or bend down, and that's what you see as a crease. It's basically a surface refusing to do what it's being told to do, which is to compress. Um, it can, there can be a number of things. Usually it's poor quality leather, or the leather is just too thick. There's too much distance between the, ex, the outside and the inside of the leather. So if you're using something like three millimeter, you're gonna get more creasing than 2.5 or two or 1.5. Um, so high quality leather, um, if it is a finished back, you're going to have to test it. Some really good quality leathers will actually take quite a bend before showing any creases. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. So ideally choose a section uh, on, the, on the actual back, on the butt of the leather. So you're going to get more creasing around the shoulders and around the, the flanks, around the bellies and things like that. So premium cuts of leather, good quality full grain leather is going to be ideal with a tight grain, so something like calf, especially is gonna be great. Uh, have, I, have I missed any more? I think. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. How much does it cost for a Nigerian to learn 
in an on in your online class um, about the same price as an American or a, or a Swede or anybody else. It's the same price. It's all good. It doesn't cost less or more. Uh, what kind of leather do you use? Um, depends on the projects. Uh, if you're asking what leather this is, this is calf leather. Very fine grained calf leather. Perfect. Right. So we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, this is a, an interesting one, perhaps a little philosophical. So <laughs> bear with me if you just like, ah, talk about tools, man. Uh, the next question is, if we could just take my attention, how did you learn to develop simple slash elegant solutions to complex problems? How did you learn to develop simple, elegant solutions to uh, complex problems? Um, that comes from a student. I assume they're talking about my courses of how I aim to explain things in a way that people can understand and make complex builds like bag making courses easy to do. To make something easy requires a lot of complexity. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's something that you get from experience. The more intimate you become, or the more familiar you become with a given subject matter, um, the more easily you will come up with simple solutions for problems. And I think it was, yeah, it was Einstein that said, um, if you can't, oh, what is it now? If you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. That's right. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So a lot of it comes down to familiarity with your subject matter. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, you know, those YouTube videos. Oh, I can't remember who it's from, um, a well-known YouTube. It's not a person company, I think where they have uh, a world leading expert on something and they have, and they get them to explain it to five different levels of understanding. So they get, you know, you might have someone who's, uh, I don't know, a brain, a world leading brain surgeon, and they're explaining brain, the brain to someone from high school, someone from, uh, you know, college, university, professional, and another expert, probably not quite at their level and their ability to explain it in a way that that person understands using language that they understand just shows how intimately familiar they are with their subject. So they get a high school person and go, okay, you know, um, imagine the brain is like an orange is there's different segments that do different things, you know, and then they go up to the expert and you can't understand what they're saying anymore because they're using jargon that only they understand. So that's someone who's very intimately familiar and that's how you, you build simple solutions to, uh, to complex problems. Um, another one is never settle for your first solution. If you're creating a bag design and you're, you know, you're figuring out how to put a pocket in a certain place or you're making a wallet and you're trying to fit as many cards in it as possible and you're trying to put gussets in it and you're trying to figure out how you're going to do it and you keep coming across problems is never settle for the first solution to any problem. Uh, always then go, okay, so that's the solution. How can I improve that solution? How can I make it simpler? If it was simpler, what would that look like? And, uh, and work from there. So that would be my advice. A question on the live. Uh, have you ever considered shoemaking? Why only bag making? Well, I am more than a one trick pony, my friend. <laughs> I'm more than just a bag man. <laughs> Is that all I am to you? Um, no, so have I ever considered, you know what, here's, here's the thing. I make bags and wallets and watch straps and belts and objet d'art, uh, you know, table objects and uh, you name it, I don't know, go and have a look at my courses. <laughs> it's a lot of different things. Um, have I ever commit? I like shoemaking. And sometimes there's certain subjects that I actively avoid knowing too much about so that I can keep the magic alive. And shoemaking is one of them. Watchmaking is another one. I love mechanical watches. I don't need to know exactly how it works. I know the basics, but I don't, 
over research and try and understand it. I don't need to, first of all, but I kind of like sometimes having a little bit of magic and shoemaking is, it's, I, yes, I understand certain parts of it. I've never made a shoe, but I love the voodoo of it. I love the craft. And I actually enjoy not knowing um, how they do what they do and just being amazed because I like handmade shoes uh, or boots. I'm a boot man, as you know, probably. Um, and yeah, if I, I could get into it, but it's a bit of a late stage. I'd probably have a bit of a step up having knowledge in leather, but I would essentially be a beginner again. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things. It's going to take years to master. And shoemaking, although you'd think that it transfers easily, I've seen many amazing, amazing shoemakers, absolutely amazing, have a go at making a wallet. <laughs> and it's not good. And it's, I've seen that many times. It just doesn't transfer. It's a bit like, you know, saddlers. It's, it's getting into refined work. It takes them a while to change the habits and the craft and the way they do things into something that actually works very differently. Um, because a shoe, there's millions of, there's an endless number of designs of shoe, but they all follow a very similar pattern. They will have a heel, they will have a toe, they will have a sole and upper a lining and all that kind of thing. That stays very rigid, but a watch strap is nothing like a bag, which is nothing like a wallet, which is nothing like a belt, which is nothing like a leather wrapped box, which is nothing like a solid leather box either. So it takes a very different, it's, it's a huge transition. It's a bigger transition than you might realize. Like people that ask me all the time, do I do upholstery? No, that's, <laughs> that's upholstery is, uh, is another thing. That's voodoo to me, it's voodoo. The way they work leather, very, very different. And if they were to try making bags, I don't think they would be particularly much better than uh, a carpenter or someone else that works with their hands. I mean, same medium, but very different type of leather, working it in different ways. It's uh, transitions aren't that easy. So that's a, a really long way of answering a simple question. That's me. Um, where did you learn leather craft, bag making, pattern making, etc.? I'm mostly self-taught from books, from collecting books, vintage at that. I started out actually buying leather from a company in Canada when I used to live there. I ended up doing lessons with the owner of the shop uh, who used to do a lot of case making, mostly rifle cases, shotgun cases, things like that. Um, so I did a few sessions with him for a period of time. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's mostly self-taught through experimentation and going through vintage books from the 1800s up until today and trying and trying and trying and trying all these different kind of techniques because I'm always fascinated more than anything with the traditional old techniques which are mostly lost, if I'm honest. And my mission is to bring them to life and bring them back again and bring these techniques to the world. You know, a lot of them lost to the masters when they died and uh, their knowledge lives on through books and I kind of wanted to recreate that and bring a lot of this knowledge back uh, which is why I'm such a tradi traditionalist. I love traditional tools, I love hand stitching, I love using all the old techniques because a lot of them in my opinion are better. Not all of them but a lot of them. So just going down, uh, hand stitch, hand stitch versus sewing machine. Uh, who wins? Well, it depends what you're stitching. I mean, if you're stitching clothing, uh, sewing machine wins. Really, it's a bit impractical. But for for leather work, I always prefer hand stitching. Um, it's more resistant to breaking. Um, and as many of you know, if you cut one stitch, you know, the other holds because hand stitching is more like weaving. You're going in and out with uh, two threads and like a figure of eight. And if you're adding a cast to your stitch as well, you're also putting an overhand knot right inside the leather. So it becomes very, very strong. So normally you may find, you know, find in your clothing, for example, or cheaper leather goods, once one piece of thread starts going, it all starts, starts unraveling and that's machine stitching for you. 
downside to hand stitching obviously is it's very time consuming. I mean, the entire live, I've done four inches of stitching. <laughs> I mean, bearing in mind, I'm going through several layers, including uh, several layers of canvas and zip tape uh, using a round door. So I have to be very careful, but yeah, it's, it's a time consuming process. Labor of love, if you will. Uh, I don't think there is one clear winner. I mean, it's the right tool for the right job situation, really. So you want to make sure that you're using the right method for the right product. And for me, that's hand stitching. But for somebody else who needs to make products more quickly in order to be uh, productive and profitable in what they do, uh, then it might make more sense for machine stitching to take place or even a compromise between the two. Much like uh, the famed Hermes, a lot of it is, is hand stitched, but on the same products, you'll also get machine stitching on parts that don't require as much strength. So there's, uh, there's no clear winner. There's just two different methods. All right, let's move on to another question. Uh, for the briefcase course, which I'm actually working on right now, uh, what size laptop will this fit? Uh, so those, for those of you who don't know, I'm working on a, a briefcase course at the moment. It's the Cutler briefcase, which is a laptop case, or has a laptop compartment, so it can be used for anything really. Uh, the design is size, so that it will fit anything up to a 15.6 inch screen. Um, and the MacBook that is 16 inches it should fit that one as well, especially in the main compartment. But it's designed up to a 15.6 inch screen and it can take two of them. Okay, not in the same compartment. There's a laptop compartment and a main compartment with separate pockets. Uh, you can put one in there. I mean, this design is actually based on a briefcase that I made, oh God, four, four or five years ago probably about four years ago, I think. Uh, and I've been using several times a week ever since. Uh, it's an absolute joy to use. And this is based on that dimensions wise with a few alterations and improvements. Uh, it's called the Thorntail briefcase. So uh, yeah, it will fit the largest of laptops within reason. I wouldn't try and put three of them in here. It'd be a bit heavy anyway. <laughs> Okay, another question. So, um, do you get cleaner stitchings? Sti stitchings? Do you get cleaner stitches using a pricking iron and an awl over regular stitching punches? So, do I get better stitching if I'm using a pricking iron to mark the leather and then finishing off with an awl? Or do I get better stitches by using a more modern pricking iron and punching all the way through the leather so that I don't need to use an awl. Well, it really depends. If I'm stitching something that's flat, um, then, and it's not particularly thick, then yeah, I'm, I'm gonna use a pricking iron and I'm gonna hit all the way through and I'm not gonna bother using an awl. If I'm stitching something that has varying thickness, it's an odd shape, you know, like the corner of a gusset. Um, anything where it's gonna be a challenge to keep a pricking iron flat and accurate during a hit, then I'm gonna simply prick the surface and then manually go through like I'm doing now with an awl. Now this isn't a bladed awl, this is just a, a round awl. In fact, this, I went all the way through with a pricking iron and then I've placed on my fabric pocket on the inside. And I don't need to use anything more than just a round awl because I'm going through a um, pre-made hole in the leather and the round awl is actually just pushing the fibers apart rather than severing them. And that saves a lot of the strength and integrity of the material pocket on the other side, uh, which is canvas in this case. So, you know, where I don't need to, I won't necessarily use an awl. So it really depends on the project itself. Okay, so last question here. Obviously, I'll take more on the live if you guys uh, have any further questions. How do you select the rigidity 
of the leather for your project and is there a way of communicating it uh, with sales? So that's a really interesting question. So how do I select the rigidity of the leathers? Well, first of all, I, I definitely recommend ordering samples. If you're going to be ordering one or more hides uh, or skins of a particular type, unless you're very familiar with what that's going to be like, I would always order samples and most good suppliers or even tanneries will be willing to sell you or sell you, send you samples. Sometimes they might ask you to pay postage costs or something like that, that's fine. That's reasonable. Um, but sometimes they'll send you samples. That helps to give you a general idea, but don't use that as you know gospel. That's not, um, because they're not gonna cut out a premium piece of hide and send that to you, hoping that you're gonna buy it. Uh, they're going to cut a section from, you know, the flank, the neck, the legs. Uh, they're not going to cut anything from the premium section. So you're going to get the not so good parts, which, you know, unless they're going to start sacrificing entire skins just for samples, most of them are going to do that. They're going to go off and just cut a little bit off here and cut a little bit off there and send it to you. Um, it's mostly for color, thickness, and overall feel, but if, you know, you might think, oh, it's a little bit too flimsy, but that's just the flank, and the rest of it would have been perfect. So, you know, ordering samples, if you can, go to a supplier or tannery, if they allow you, if you've built a relationship with them, and uh, just ask to have a feel, and just, you know, use your hands, use your eyes, bend the leather, feel for it and get that experience. Uh, the next thing is, is prototyping parts. So if you have the leather, or if you have a lot of leather in stock and you wanna try different leathers on, on, on uh, different parts that you're prototyping, do so, so that you can get a general idea of whether or not it's going to work. And that could be really, really helpful. Uh, and might tell you whether or not you need reinforcements, which is the next thing I've written down is if it's, not quite rigid enough, don't be afraid of adding some reinforcement just to stiffen it up a little bit. It doesn't have to be on every part, it can be on just some parts. Nothing wrong with that. Um, the last part of that question is, uh, is there a way of communicating that with sales? So how do you select the rigidity of your leather for your projects and is there a way of communicating that with sales? I, you know, if you're not sure how to communicate it, it's probably best not to. I would recommend creating video, okay, which is what I used to do uh, when I made products for sale, which I don't anymore because I, I teach full time. But it's you'll communicate much better about the structure of the bag and how it looks and how it feels and how it works and how it bends and folds. If you just take a video of you using it or putting things inside it or taking things out of it, um, let them see it rather than try and explain it, which opens up uh, the possibility of miscommunication. So rather than go, it's about as rigid as wet cardboard, <laughs> I don't know how you would communicate rigidity. It's, it's firm, it holds itself, uh, sure. But uh, a video of you using it, they'll get a general idea. And that's uh, a picture paints a thousand words, I think is the expression. Might be, might not be. But uh, a video is, is an entire dictionary. So let them see visually, let, it, let them see it move. Okay, I'm just going to scroll up on the gram. See if you guys have... Uh, said anything a lot of love heart eyes thank you very much a bit late to the party what is your go-to thread my go-to thread is uh the traditional thread of course it's either going to be uh a filet chinois or la cable or it's going to be barbers a barbers linen thread i like to buy vintage linen thread i'll show you what that looks like Proper old school barbers, best quality linen thread. I think this was in the early 80s from before I was born. Uh, made in the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, with the red right hand. <laughs> Proper old school. Arrives in wax paper. 
really consistent. Woo. That's, those are the days I believe they, would, they were still picking flax by hand, I think, uh, because the consistency is really good. If ever you can get hold of some vintage thread, even on eBay and things like that, if they're still in their original packaging, uh, it doesn't really degrade with time. Uh, just as strong as anything modern and uh, generally, in my opinion, more consistent. But yeah, my go-to thread, usually barbers uh, or finishing one. Proper traditional. Uh, does your course have a bifold build tutorial? Uh, I have a few different wallets, passport wallets. I have uh, a uh, coat wallet, which is like a bifold, but just longer. Um, but I don't have a, a, a common bifold, mainly because there's so many courses out there. There's even ones on YouTube, um, so many build-alongs, and, and everybody already kind of makes them. My, what I try and do is, is create courses uh, around what's not out there, if you know what I mean. Um, a little bit more niche than that. So stuff that's really really obvious, well not obvious, but common, then I don't really generally make a course around that. I might do one day, but it would have to be very different. I'd have to modify it somehow. Almost at the end of this stitch run. And then what I'll do is I'll um, take this out of the clams and I'll show you the, uh, the rear side of it. So you can kind of get an idea of what's going on here. So what I am gonna do is move this, oh no, I can't move it up because that's stuck there, isn't it? Um, let's create a simple, elegant solution. <laughs> let's put some pattern weights here just to help stop it moving around. So yeah, this, uh, this is the Cutler briefcase. Uh, a little bit different on this course because I'm using uh, fabric as a lining, well, thick canvas. Uh, I don't know, I haven't worked with canvas as a lining uh, on any of my courses. So what I wanted to do is introduce a new technique because it does take a little bit of, of change to work with fabric. Um, there's certain things you can do with fabric that you can't do with leather and there's certain things you can't do with leather that you can do with fabric. So there are a few changes, but it, I wanted to introduce something in the course that gives people the flexibility to change things up a little bit, you know, especially making goods for summer or making goods that are a little bit more casual. Working with fabric is uh, really nice and I love canvas, especially off-white canvas with tan leather, which is what this is going to be. Um, it just really add something else to your mental toolbox. So if ever you want to create something with, with fabric or you get a custom order from someone that wants a, a material lining, then you'll have the skills to be able to do that. So it's just adding a little bit more knowledge to your, uh, to your toolbox upstairs. But also I wanted to showcase a new design for rolled handles. It's just much easier. Um, than traditional rolled handles around a circular core, tubular core. Because for that really, to pull that off well, um, for molding its shape, for pricking it, for creasing it, for cutting it, you really do uh, benefit if you make a jig. But that's a whole nother process. So the handles on this are designed so that you don't need to do that. Okay, I'm gonna do one more stitch and then I'll give you guys a, a preview of the rear side. Obviously this thread is, is matching the color, so you won't really see any stitching. Uh, does anyone know a good place to buy fabric with a chevron pattern for bag linings? Uh, what, what country are you in? I take it you've, uh, you've checked that on Google already. Okay, so this is the bit that I've just been stitching in. 
And on the inside, you can see there, we have our pocket lining. So this is our canvas lining. On the rear side, you can see the line that I've just been stitching all the way along there. So that is the internal pocket. And this is a canvas pocket. So it's going to be matching. This will actually be covered with the lining of the bag itself. So you'll not be seeing any of this, but it's always nice when you open up and you see the same color, the same fabric, the same material uh, as you have on the inside. Just a, a little small detail that really shows that you've been thinking about the design. I mean, if you're, I mean, you can use whatever you want for the internal pocket. Sometimes, in fact, the de Havilland travel bag that's over there that I use daily. Um, I have a, a kid skin lining uh, for a pop of color. So that's been done intentionally. So uh, it really stands out. In fact, I'll show you rather than uh, just talk about it. This is my daily bag. It's been quite a few places with me now. So um, if I open up the inside, you'll see here, if I can get that on camera, you'll see a blue lining. If I pull it out, you actually see the color a little bit there. So that is just a pop of color that I add and it's completely mismatched to the point where it's obviously done on purpose um, rather than just very subtly off, which doesn't look as good. So either matching or very off is, uh, you know, it just adds a little bit more of a dynamic thing. It was mainly done because I love the classic colors and everything like that, but just like a London bespoke suit, sometimes gentlemen who have a uh, suit tailored will go for a really bright, shocking pink lining or something with crazy patterns. But when it's done up, it's very formal and very traditional, uh, almost very bland on the outside, which is kind of the British way, is uh, the man should be at the forefront rather than his suit uh, speak for him. So uh, sometimes just for a little personality, you have a pop of color on the inside. It might even just be the inside pocket or, you know, any of the pockets uh, and that's why I did that it's just something a little bit different but anyway yeah I, I generally go for a matching pocket but sometimes I like to go you know completely off the scale and go for a, a shocking color which is always really interesting and that kid skin suede is the softest leather um, you'll, you'll ever touch um, have they replied with where they are in the world oh USA not sure for that kind of thing for really cool patterns and designs and uh, high quality stuff um i like to go to uh, liberties in london um which is uh, kind of like a department store really upmarket department store but they're really famed for their uh, fabrics that you can buy on the roll there um but i guess you want the chevron pattern just like hermes that's their kind of signature uh, so use linen thread. How do I finish my stitching? Uh, a good old stuffing with a round or and a little PVA before hammering in. You'd be surprised how strong that is. Atelier 56. Clappy hands and love eyes. <laughs> uh, in addition to using beeswax, What's a good way to prep thread so that it doesn't coil when being pulled? Um, coiling doesn't matter so much unless, unless you're actually getting tangled. Sometimes it uh, depends. I mean, if it's linen, that can be an issue. But what I would do is try and prevent it from happening every now and again. I don't know if you may have seen me do it, is I let go of the needles completely because sometimes they gain a twist. And if they gain a twist and you're pulling through quickly, because it's pulling through quickly really does it. If you're getting a big twist, but you're doing it slowly, it has time to unravel. Um, but if you're pulling through quickly, that can uh, immediately cause a knot, which sometimes happens. Um, but how do I prep the thread? First of all, don't have too much beeswax on it. Make sure that once you've pulled it through, that you've got a lot of it off. Um, another way of doing it is just putting some on there and then just melting it over uh, something warm like uh, an ironing tip for a fill or uh, hair dryer is another one or if you're very careful over a flame 
so that it soaks in and then just wipe it a few times. That's another way of doing it. Uh, is it upholstery grade fabric for durability? I have, can I have had canvas tear, tear up after years of use in client bags. Well, it depends, depends on the quality of the canvas, right? Because if you've got linen canvas, which is probably the strongest, um, you've got long stable, staple cotton canvas, which uses the longer threads, uh, like Egyptian cotton. Um, cheaper canvases that are short staple. The staple, staple sorry, is another way of saying fiber length. Um, so you might have fiber lengths of, you know, eight millimeters on cheaper cotton, 15 on more expensive cotton, up to 25 millimeters uh, on, you know, the top grade cottons. And the longer it is, the more friction it has after it's been twisted. Uh, it, does, it can't slip past itself as easy when it's longer. So there's different grades. So I wouldn't just go, canvas isn't good enough. It might just be the canvas that you purchased, uh, unfortunately. And it can also be a case of, you know, you stitched it in, but you didn't finish the edge. Uh, so for example, on, on the back here, you might be able to see, this is actually a turned edge. So I'm stitching through two layers. So if I was to try and pull on these stitches with this canvas really hard, it's not going towards an edge that's cut. It's going towards a turned edge, which makes it exponentially stronger. Um, than just going on a, a raw edge. So turning the edges and then stitching them in together and things like that. So it comes down to technique and the quality of the canvas. Um, upholstery grade fabric is usually split. So, you know, this is uh, full grain and this will be the top split. Uh, the next rung down will be a bottom split and that might go off to upholstery. And then what they do is they spray the top with resins, usually synthetic resins like polyurethane, and then they impression through rollers or plates, uh, a leather look uh, like a fake grain. And that is generally upholstery fabric. You know, you can get full grain upholstery fabric, but the, the costs of an armchair or a sofa in full grain are ridiculously high. Um, yeah, a lot of money, like a new car kind of money. But uh, yeah, upholstery grade fabric is usually, a, uh, you know, definitely a, grain, a grade lower, commonly referred to uh, as um, genuine leather. Right, I'm at the bottom. Okay, so, so thank you for joining me today during this live stitching in the pocket on the latest course release, which is the Cutler briefcase. Part one is out now, part two is coming very shortly. And if you still wanna get the tool buyer's guide and the leather selection video, which is gonna show you what leathers to buy, how to buy them, what to look for, how to test them, as well as a tool buyer's guide, which shows you exactly what you need, depending on what level you are as a crafter. Then don't forget to visit leathercraftmasterclass.com, which is linked below. All you have to do is put your email address in the pop-up and I will immediately send you the guides free of charge. So don't forget to check that out. In the meantime, thank you for watching me and I will see you in the next video.